So my name is Lawrence Friedman. Uh, I was Professor of War Studies at King's College London until 2014. I've been Emeritus Professor of War Studies since then, um, but I still write and research on all aspects of armed conflict. Um, I was a member of the Iraq Inquiry, but I also write more generally on strategic issues, broadly defined how people uh, do strategy, uh, as, as well as big geopolitical questions. And would you be able to explain what, how the Iraq Inquiry came about and what role you played in it? Uh, well, the Iraq Inquiry came about because the Prime Minister of the day, Gordon Brown, uh, had been persuaded that his backbenchers were unhappy with what had happened with Iraq and wanted to understand it better. Um, he set it up as a lessons learned inquiry. Um, my role was that I was appointed to be a member of the panel, so I only knew about it as a thing to do about a few days before it was announced. Um, uh, but then there were five of us, sadly, one died, Martin Gilbert, and um, so we um, held the hearings, did the questioning of witnesses, oversaw the writing of the report, contributed to the report, and took responsibility for the judgments in the report, which came out in uh, 2016. What was the outcome of the... Well, the main job of the report was to, um, uh, I think, to, to, to provide a full account, a reliable account of what had actually happened, which meant going into considerable detail. On that basis, uh, the inquiry obviously had to form judgments on responsibility, which I suppose the most important judgment was that um, the uh, Prime Minister Blair had uh, gone to war uh, before diplomacy had been exhausted. It wasn't a last resort. Um, and secondly, the preparations for the conflict had been very poor. Uh, and therefore, the aftermath was pretty awful. And that could have been foreseen, possibly uh, at least mitigated. And do you think it's important that nations have this process of inquiry into wars? Well, you don't. I mean, there's a lot of conflict goes on. Um, and people are ask, hopefully asking questions and challenging all the way through. I think when something like Iraq, where uh, people felt they'd been misled, um, it's important to have uh, a reckoning of some sort. Um, so I think it, is a, it was a healthy thing to do. I wouldn't particularly advocate it for every conflict. It's not a cheap thing to do. It takes a lot of time. Um, and you may end up just rediscovering what you already knew. Uh, but in this case, I think it was important that people had a full description, a really full description, um, from which they could necessarily form their own judgments about what happened uh, and why it had happened. So in that sense, I think it was useful, uh, a good thing to do. Um, but you know, th th these, these things should only be undertaken for special cases rather than just as a matter of course. And so would you say it was more about uh, the po general public's feelings or the access to knowledge about the war rather than the government learning from lessons? From well, I think there were, I mean, it's a fair point. And I think we did make recommendations and draw some lessons about you know, can you influence an American administration? Uh, how do you prepare uh, for um, the aftermath of a conflict? Um, some issues to do with military planning and logistics. There are also I mean, the, the things, we, it would be nice to think the government might learn from, and I know some bits of government have been trying to learn from. But I think, you know, the reason for the inquiry was that um, it was premised on the assumption that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq which were never found, uh, which certainly didn't exist. And secondly, um, that, uh, it dragged on a long time and was very painful, not least for the Iraqis. A lot of our own service people were killed. Um, and so I think there was a feeling that something had gone wrong in terms of both what had been promised uh, 
and uh, unintended consequences. So in that sense, uh, it was addressing public concern. Would you be able to go into a little bit more detail about how you said that some parts of government are trying to learn from the lessons? In what ways is that happening? Well, the Ministry of Defence has produced a sort of little, bo a little booklet about things that you need to take into account with mem any military operation. Um, and I think one of the conclusions we were trying to push was that if you were in government, whether in the military or a civil servant, and you were bothered, um, then you really should challenge and you should feel able to challenge what was going on. Uh, you know, if everybody believes something that turns out to be completely wrong, and there was a bit of that in this case, uh, then the challenge may be limited. But in some areas, people were worried, had concerns, uh, and didn't quite know how to express them. And I, you know, it would be good to think that, that if we ever we were doing something like this again, which I'm not sure we will, but if we ever did, um, that if people had concerns, they would feel able to say, um, uh, this really isn't a very good idea, or have you thought of this, or why don't you try that? Uh, I mean, there's limits to how far that can go. In the end, somebody's got to take responsibility, uh, and, that, and you know, th th that may involve ignoring reasonable concerns. But at least they should know that those concerns are there, and that if they how do decide to ignore them, they're doing so explicitly. And looking to the future, you've done work on how you see war will progress in the future, moving more to civil wars rather than international wars. What is your theory of the future? <laughs> I don't have a theory. I mean, the, 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 the future of war is as likely as not to look pretty much like the past of war. Um, in the last few decades, civil wars have become more important than interstate wars. Interstate wars were always you know, few and far between, They're very nasty when they occurred. Uh, but civil wars are pretty constant. Uh, there are you know, some on all the time. And some of them are very bloody indeed. And uh, conventional, uh, sort of conventional wars that people think about, you know, may happen in terms of, sort of regular armies fighting each other. Um, but a lot of the, the wars that do take place are militias, firing mortars in the vague direction of other militias um, and society is gradually breaking down with um, tragic human consequences. So um, sadly these wars continue and we haven't really done very well in finding ways either through the UN or elsewhere um, to, um, to stop them. I mean they, they died, I mean the Syrian conflict may subside a bit because uh, one side, effectively Assad, has won, but it, it, it'll never quite, you'll never quite get control of his country again. I mean, there's a proliferation of civil war, but isn't it still international in nature if we look at the financing of war or weapons? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, there's never any truly internal conflict. I mean, even the American Civil War you know, had an external important external dimensions. Who, you know, where do you go to for support? Where do you go to for finance and weaponry and so on? Obviously, th these make a difference. And then in a lot of, say, the African wars around, say, the Great Lakes region, uh, lot, other countries have just interfered. They've come in on one side rather than another. They may do it in the guise of peacekeeping, but essentially they're, um, they're participants. Um, so you can't really often make a sharp distinction between interstate and intrastate wars. They, they, they blur into one another, especially in uh, these parts of the world where uh, the political structures are, are, are not very well defined already and borders don't always mean very much. Do you think the stakes have risen though? Do you think nuclear weaponry is sort of a, a major breaking change or is it just that wars develop in different ways or do you see? Um, well, nuclear weapons don't affect civil wars very much but the existence of nuclear weapons from 1945 certainly had a very important dampening effect on major war conflict. And, uh, if you think that if you take a, an aggressive step you could well find yourself in a complete conflagration that would 
demolish your country as well as much else, then you're going to be a little bit more cautious than if you think it, it, you know, there's costs and risks, but maybe they're worth taking. So I think uh, what nuclear weapons have done is it makes it harder to conceive of major powers going to war, or even nuclear powers, say India and Pakistan going to war, though we've got close to that um, in recent times. Um, but uh, other forms of conflict will, will, will carry on and possibly become more important simply because um, the big wars aren't, aren't, aren't going to happen now. So you may, uh, the major powers may try to pers pursue their interests through support of factions in, in elsewhere rather, rather than take on their opponents directly. And you've talked slightly about the sort of failure or that we haven't found a way of stopping war. Do you think uh, a sort of global framework like the UN will still be relevant if we're seeing civil wars uh, as a main... Well, it can be relevant. Um, it can be more relevant with civil wars than other types. Um, a lot of peacekeeping forces have been sent in, but unfortunately, um, you know, they're not disinterested. Um, uh, and in some cases, they've made it worse uh, rather than better. Um, and, you know, if you produce armies of not particularly well-paid... Um, uh, young men, uh, they, you know, they, they don't necessarily behave well in the countries which they're going um, and are not always very well disciplined. So, uh, so, the first, so first, yes, there is a, um, the UN can do things, can, can organise conferences, try to establish uh, peaceful settlements, uh, try to support them through peacekeeping. In some cases it's done that quite well, which shouldn't be too negative. Um, but there are limits on what it can do, and probably the limits are, feel a bit more um, strong. People are more aware of the limits at the moment than in the past. There's greater optimism in the past. And are there certain areas of the world that you predict will be sort of the highest conflict zones? Well, it's not hard. I mean, Africa clearly um, suffers a, a lot of regular conflict. It, it's different. I mean, if you look at some Latin American cities, for example, um, Brazil or, or um, Mexico, they're not, you wouldn't call it war, they're not at war, uh, but the fights between gangs involve an awful lot of young people, lots of young people at times, getting killed. Um, they are pretty well armed at times. Um, so it varies with the sort of conflicts that you see in the Middle East. Um, clearly, there's been some tremendous upheavals um, in the Syrian civil war. I mean, people just stopped counting in terms of the loss of life there because it became impossible to follow what was going on. But certainly hundreds of thousands of people have died there. And as a professor of war, do you still think that the, the word war has meaning? Is it significant? As you said, like, they're not at war, but well, will we ever reach a point where one nation declares war on another? Well, it's possible. I mean, yeah, I mean, countries can go to war. Um, I mean, the, the origins of the notion of war are constant. The word war uh, comes from an old word meaning sort of confusion um, and sort of disorderly time um, and obviously mayhem and violence and so on. And that doesn't have to be state on state. Um, and, and so, the, you know, there's always, there is always a question the example I was given before about militias fighting in a, in a, in a city, is that war? Is it gang violence? Um, at what point can you call it a civil war? Is that a useful concept or should we just keep it to interstate wars? Um, the fact is it's used in the way it's used. It's not. It's one of those words that's got out of its box a long time ago. So anytime organized groups are fighting each other, it'll be called a war. Sometimes we talk about, you know, cyber war when nobody's getting killed or there's much violence. Um, um, just we're referring to conflict. I think that actually starts not to be helpful. I think, to me, war involves purpose of violence. If, if groups are using violence for a purpose, then it's probably justifiable to call it war. If they're in, just in conflict, it's not particularly helpful. And what about the role of uh, 
war studies in general, and a lot of focus in politics and in academia is on war rather than peace. Is there an extent to which a focus on war perpetuates the sort of uh, presence of war? Well, it used to be a sort of slogan of my department, if you, if you want peace, think about war. Um, there is actually a department of peace studies. Um, actually, in, in the war studies department at King's, um, there's an awful lot of work would be, could well come under the heading of peace studies. It's about conflict resolution, uh, conflict avoidance. Um, I mean, it's sort of a myth about a war studies that it's sort of is militarist and promotes war. So to say we've got quite a backlog to study, we don't need any more. Uh, so uh, it's a phenomenon, it exists, it happens, and you can learn a lot about societies, uh, human beings, in terms of how wars are fought. Uh, hopefully you can also learn uh, what you need to do to stop it or to bring it to a close quickly, sometimes sometimes to fight it more efficiently if that's what you have to do. So I think there's a point in studying. It wouldn't do for everybody to do it. You know, there's nicer things to study. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an odd, odd way to spend one's life, but uh, uh, probably just as well some people do it. And are there any leaders at the moment that you think are particularly signs of hope in the way that they go about their foreign policy or...? <laughs> it's not a good time. Not really. <laughs> I mean, I think there are, you know, there, there are some, there are some sensible people around in Europe and elsewhere. Um, but if you look at the heads of the major powers of, of Russia, China, and the United States, I think they're all flawed in different ways. And uh, it's a good test as, as to uh, whether or not uh, the. Uh, Sort of rational considerations about the dangers of war um, keep us out of, of conflict when you have leaders who can be quite uh, bellicose. And finally, are there any uh, thinkers, books, war strategists that you have particularly inspired you and you would recommend to others? <laughs> um, well, I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of good writing, historical writing about war. I think probably this, this period has produced, this last 10 years has produced some of the best military histories uh, about the Second World War and so on, because um, I think what's happened is that um, uh, there's been a greater readiness to look at the experience of war of individuals so that you marry um, war as lived experience for those on the battlefield or those in the home front or wherever. So I, I, th I think that there's a, a lot to be said for books which now look at war as lived experience, whether in, on, on battle you know, or on the home front, as against just, but, but you need this as well, um, what were the strategies being followed by the, by the powers, what led them into war, why did they do it the way they did it. Um, you need that as well. So I think the, the, the good military history uh, marries that. And, you know, you, so there's uh, books by this country, Anthony Beaver, Max Hastings, uh, James Holland, I mean, there are, and many others are good. You know, the sort of military strategy, interestingly, people still go back to, to classics. Uh, Clausewitz on war, uh, produced uh, in the early 1830s, um, posthumously by his wife. It's still a remarkable book and a powerful book about the different, the interaction, interplay of um, politics, military capability, popular will, um, battlefield conditions. It's, it's a very, uh, still a powerful piece of work. In recent times, the economist Tom Schelling, um, who was largely in trying to engage with nuclear issues, genuinely innovative thinker in helping us understand the extent to which even people at conflict with each other sometimes have shared interests and that can shape the way uh, that they, they fight so that they don't fight to the death, they understand that that's not what they want to do so they try to find ways of, of bargaining uh, that don't involve uh, complete catastrophe. And finally, if you had the chance to set the curriculum of uh, 
histories in schools in this country. Over the last hundred years, what were the, like, the core lessons that you would want uh, school children or people to learn about from the wars we've been involved in? Gosh, I mean, I, th I think, you know, there's only so much war you can cram down youngsters' throats. Um, and I think one of the difficulties, we tend to get very fixated on the First World War um, in terms of the experience of the trenches or the Second World War in terms of the rise of the Nazis and, and so on. And obviously kids do need to know about this sort of thing. Um, the further we get away from it, the more distant these experiences are. Um, I think there is a real challenge of um, trying to get over why our countries did get involved in these things. But I also think they need to know some recent history. You know, it's surprising that people will tell you, you know, kids will tell me a lot about um, the Third Reich, um, but they don't know very much about the Cold War or the Cuban Missile Crisis or Berlin. Uh, and probably even less about what was going on in the 90s. And, you know, these are um, as far away from them as, uh, as the First World War, say, was for me when I was a kid. So I, I think um, that they need to know some more contemporary stuff. Uh, as, you know, at some, po at some point, the remembrance of the First and Second World Wars, while always being important, shouldn't crowd out. Um, helping them try to understand why we are where we are at the moment. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.